Okay, fantastic. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone firstly, and I'm going to put my uh, start with my video. Um, wish you all a very happy new year. It's fantastic to see so many of you here today. And, um, you know, this is this is the first guy in speaks of the year. For those who haven't joined us before, just to say that we've been going since about 2017 and that we run events on the last Sunday of every month. Um, those are our regular events and then we do sort of ad hoc events through the year. So this is one of the examples of the ad hoc events that we do. Um, and we've done this precisely because uh, Thomas Harding's book has just recently been launched, I believe sometime around the 6th of January. Um, and so therefore we wanted it to be, you know, this event to be very timely. Um, just in terms of the housekeeping, please all make sure that you're, you're on mute. Um, we have had um, sort of internet trolls in the past. So if I, if we suddenly get interrupted, um, I'll just put everything on hold and get rid of the, the troll, but hopefully um, that won't happen today. Um, and that's the reason why we're quite strict, up, strict about making sure you show your names on the screen so that I can identify everybody that's here. Um, so if your name isn't identifiable, you will just go straight back into the uh, waiting room until you've changed your name. Um, the other thing to say is that if you have any questions or if you have any comments about the event, please put them in the comments section and so that we can relay the questions to um, Thomas and to our other guests. So you will have seen on the screen that's been going um, round and round that we are also, we've also today got um, Errol Brewster, um, who is an artist and one of the contributors to the book. Um, Eric Phillips from the Guyana Reparations Committee, and also Kibwe Copeland, who is the president of the Ikema Youth Organization. And um, I'm sure there are other people here as well. Um, I saw a few other names flash up that I recognize from the book as well. So perhaps you can join in the audience conversation when we get there. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I just wanted to mention uh, for those who haven't joined before is that if you do want to go onto our circular, please just email us at dianaspeaks at gmail.com or go to Diana Speaks on Facebook um, where you'll find that we regularly update um, our members with the event details. Um, and also just so that you know, for the end of this month, we have an event that looks at women with British and Guyanese backgrounds, um, their second, third generation diasporan women. We have Alina Moore, sorry, Alida Moore, um, Erica Basemba, Natalie Quayle and Selena Jane, and also possibly um, Zinzi Sewell. Uh, they're all fabulously successful young women and uh, we just wanna hear what uh, Guyana means to them. So it's just gonna be a, a conversation about that. And then on a final note, obviously with this conversation, um, being about a book called White Debt, uh, focusing on the Demerara uprising, but also on the issue of reparations. It's a subject that can get a bit heated. Um, so I would just ask that, you know, obviously we want this to be a really interesting discussion, but we also want to make sure that we're not using derogatory or rude language. And if anybody does, again, I'm gonna be evil and wicked and throw you into the waiting room or possibly out altogether. So let's just remember to be civil and polite to each other, which we always have been in the past. So it's not, it's not a reflection on anything from the past. I just, I just thought I would um, add that in there um, for people who haven't been part of uh, Guyana Speaks before. Um, then the other thing, well, I don't know how many of you know about the um, Guyana Demerara rebellion or uprising, probably more appropriate to call it that. Um, um, and, I, and I can see there are a few people here who don't have Guyanese backgrounds, probably historians, people who are interested. Um, so it's actually really interesting that we're almost 200 years, it's nearly 200 years since the, um, the rebellion, which essentially kind of swept the colony of, of Demerara in British Guyana. And um, it's estimated that about 12,000 enslaved people were involved from around 55 plantations between Lilliandal and Mahaika um, on the East Coast that participated. And I think probably 
if you want to know more about that, I'm going to say read the book. Um, but maybe maybe Thomas uh, might want to say a little bit more um, about the details of the uprising. And before I move on, of course, I'm just going to say, um, you know, Thomas, uh, we all welcome you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Um, I looked you up on, I, I normally actually get a bio from people and I, and I didn't with you because I just thought this is going to be quite a long conversation. So I didn't want to spend too much time on it. But just to say that um, I looked you up on Wikipedia and it says that you are an award-winning non-fiction author, journalist and documentary maker um, with, you know, British, American, German citizenship. So interesting background. But what I found most interesting about the um, entry was actually that the common thread through all of your work seems to be that you're keenly interested in social justice. And um, I wanted to know if that's a, a fair comment and also kind of what shaped you? What, what, why, how did you come to be uh, such a powerful social justice warrior? <laughs> Well, um, when you say, thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's, it's honestly, it's a huge honor. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and to uh, see all the people who've dialed in from around the world is, is so exciting. And I really look forward to hearing from the other guest speakers and the questions later on. Uh, I mean, to answer your question, uh, I, you know, they, it's always mattered to me. I've always been someone who cares about inequality who's interested my when I was a kid my my siblings my brothers and sisters were, would always complain that I, I was asking too many questions that I was too curious so when I used to go to the to the movies I used to bug them saying what's going on who's doing that <laughs> I wasn't the best person to go to the cinema to, with but yeah I've always been curious and I've always been interested and I've always wanted to you know make things as much as I can better so sort of carrying on in that light I was um thinking really about the book. I mean, you're reading through the book and it clearly, um, in terms of the uprising, connecting that directly to the issue of reparations um, and who's responsible for it and what do you do about it? And the title of the book kind of answers the question with white debt being the title. I thought it was a really direct kind of uncompromising title. And I was wondering if, um, you know, given you're somebody who makes a living from publishing books, if you had been a little bit afraid about one, alienating the very people you were trying to reach, but also of a kind of a backlash. I like the fact that you're into your second question and you're right into the heart, heart of the matter. Uh, yes, absolutely. It was a really, it was a really long conversation. And there were some people who were resistant. They were worried that the title would upset people. It would offend people. Uh, they were worried that, uh, that I was seen as a, someone who wrote about history. And this is me talking about contemporary issues. I'm in the wrong lane and it's nothing to do with me. And, and I might upset my readers. And, and I said, this is the right thing to do. And it feels really important to me. And yeah, the, the, the title is is direct, but I think it needs to be direct because I think, I mean, look, I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, I've come at this quite late, but it's, it's pretty obvious to me or became obvious to me that there's an enormous debt that white people owe uh, the descendants of those enslaved. And that is, that's the truth. Okay, so maybe there's some consequences. Maybe it's gonna upset some people and it's already upset some people, uh, but that's, so be it. And I'm, 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 the most important thing for me is to have a conversation. And this is why today I'm so looking forward to. And to try and to have a conversation in the way that people are included. You know, one of, my, one of my genuine concerns was that, you know, by writing about this subject in such a way, I might just put some people off. And I hope that hasn't been the case. I hope that when people pick up the book and they, they read it, that the story and the characters are interesting enough that they'll get caught up in it. Because I was. I mean, I was, I was so impressed and awed by uh, particularly Jack Gladstone, Kwamina and, and the enslaved, what I call the enslaved abolitionists. Um, this extraordinary bravery, but also intelligence and organization skills and compassion and uh, forward thinking. You know, I was, you know, just in, in terms of the way that they organize themselves. So I hope that other people will see that. And of course, they're flawed characters like everybody is. And that's true also of the white characters in the book, whether it be John Gladstone, the politician and slaveholder, or uh, John Cheverly, 
who got mixed up in the whole story. He was, he, his family had no money in Britain and the only way to keep the family going was to send the sons overseas. That often happened. And John ended up in Demerara, really just chasing a job. And he ended up as a clerk in a, in a general store. And then he then got enlisted in the militia and got, to his, to his horror, got um, dragged into the suppression, the brutal, brutal suppression of the enslaved people. And he wrote about this brilliantly. And then, of course, John Smith, this extraordinary white missionary, who is, I, I, as, as I understood it, when I went to Guyana, is remembered to quite a good degree in, in, in Guyana, whether it be at the church, named after him, or, or in, in other communities. Uh, but he's also a flawed character. And when I read some of his journals, he kept this extraordinary diary, 60,000 words. You know, he, he said some things which were deeply, deeply racist. And in, in, you know, when you look at it today, unforgivable. So uh, each of these characters I found incredibly interesting to write about and learn about. Yeah, I thought you're mentioning John Cheveley is reminding me of a, of a question I was going to ask you later on, because I was I, I, my background is literary. So what mm -hmm. I loved about your book was actually just felt so literary, even thinking about the structure and you've got sort of arrival, uprising and trial. And then that's kind of uh, the chapters are then divided into the history and then your reflections on it. But all of the names actually are, all of the protagonists are Johns. So Jack obviously being a pet name for John and then John Cheveley, <laughs> John Gladstone, John Smith, yeah. you know, and I just thought, is this a happy coincidence or did you choose John Cheveley, who was the unexpected character for me? Um, did you choose him? Because he was also John. I mean, what was it? Was it a happy coincidence? Because I mean, as a, as a storyteller, that was a total nightmare because having six characters called John <laughs> is, is liable to confuse the reader. So what I did is I just used their last names and um, hopefully people will be able to track who's who. Uh, no, John Cheveley, I chose him because he wrote this. I mean, speaking about literary, his, his writing is, is just fantastic. I mean, he writes with beautiful creativity and colour and... I think quite rarely for the time, emotional intelligence. You really get to see his transformation as this man who's a fish out of water, who's somebody who doesn't quite fit in, who's, but then gets caught up in the colonial, colonist culture. And then through his experience, because of the brutal oppression of the enslaved abolitionists, he then comes to his own awakening and realization about the horrors of slavery and, and uh, the inequality that is you know was imperialism uh, in in the colony of Demerara uh, so I, yeah I mean that's why that's why John Cheveley was included not not because of his name <laughs> no, well, I, I just like that's the sort of thing that tickles no me. it's no, right there's like, a lot of Johns well, how come they're all Johns <laughs> But um, I think one thing we have to sort of talk about going get again back to this whole issue of, of social justice is and, and language, the language that you use was so important. Mm. I mean, you clearly you, you've capitalized both uh, black and white in, yeah. in, in, in the book, which I thought was really interesting. But also, more importantly, you're kind of seriously challenging the notion that most of us have of, of British as the great emancipators by by calling the abolition, by calling the enslaved Africans who previously have been seen as rebels, I guess, or, or uh, yeah. as, as, as abolitionists. And I thought that was genius. I was really, I, I felt the book was groundbreaking in so many different ways, but that I think was phenomenally important. How did you kind of arrive at that? Well, I mean, that's very kind of you. And it, it was, again, you're being very um, intuitive and observant. That was, very, that was a very big part of it for me. You know, when I, when I was growing up, in Britain, I wasn't taught about British slavery. We, you know, if, if we taught anything in my experience, it was about we were the great emancipators. We were the ones who William Wilberforce, his associates, uh, and they were all white the way I was taught about it. Of course, that wasn't the case. Um, they were the ones who, who, who freed the slaves. And, and if I knew maybe something about this thing called the triangle, the triangular trade, but I didn't really understand what it was. And if I knew that what I did know was about the United States and the slavery there, you know, from, you know, the movies Gone with the Wind, Django Unchained, or 12, 12 Years a Slave, you know, those kind of things. So I was much more familiar with that. And, you know, when I was writing a previous book about my mother's family, uh, who were this uh, big catering company in Britain, they were called the Salmons and the Glucksteins. I learned that before that business in the 19th century, they had a tobacco company called Salmon and Glucksteins, and it ended up being one of the biggest retailers of tobacco in Europe. 
And if you were selling tobacco, importing tobacco in the 19th century, almost certainly the tobacco was coming from the United States. And before 1865, that meant from plantations worked by enslaved people. And then after that, uh, they were still importing tobacco from Cuba, which continued to have slavery to the 1880s. And so that was a real shock to me. And that, that led me on a journey to like understand or really investigate, because I'm embarrassed, honestly, I'm embarrassed how little I knew about slavery at that time. And I just started reading all the books I could find. And then I was very lucky enough to go to Guyana and I met with some extraordinary people like Winston McGowan and Cecilia McCalmont, spoke to Nigel Westmass and, and, and other people who really had looked at this history. And, I, and I, um, I'm very grateful to their research. And it became pretty obvious to me that the word uh, rebel, which is what was always used in the texts about Jack Gladstone and Kwamana, didn't quite fit. For me, rebel has this sense of being outside the system, of being kind of fighting against what's right and established. And, you know, rebel, rebellion, insurrection, protest, demonstrated, none of these words were right for me. And then I was, um, somebody was helping me with the script and I, I'm, they, we were having this conversation and they said, well, I've got a couple of ideas for you because we had this conversation backwards and forwards. And he said, well, what about Freedom Fighter? And I said, well, that's, I mean, I totally see how Freedom Fighter would work. They're fighting for freedom. But for my situation, when I was growing up, Freedom Fighter was always associated with, you know, people who are using armed, in, armed violence, armed insurrection, whether it be in Vietnam or, or in Cuba, or in Central America. And that didn't quite feel right because Jack Gladstone, one of the really interesting things about Jack Gladstone was his uh, commitment to nonviolence. I mean, he re really, and he was known for that. And, he, and in, even in court, many of the colonists stood up for him and said he stopped the violence, which I think is an extraordinary thing. So to call them freedom fighters for me didn't quite work. So then he said, well, the alternative is this, this expression or this term enslaved abolitionist. And at first I was like, hmm, abolitionists, because when I, for me, abolitionists are the, the white people in England or Britain, you know, who are fighting with William Wilberforce. And I'm like, hang on a second, you're absolutely right. I mean, they were obviously enslaved and obviously they were trying to abolish slavery. So once I got over that, I saw, I did a mind experiment, thought experiment, and I, there's a passage in the book where the British militia are doing just, I mean, awful things. I mean, really horrific and and I felt I needed to put them in the book. I mean, part of me was like, no, don't put it in because it might upset people. But I felt important to acknowledge the brutality and the, the violence. And at one stage, you know, I talk about the British militia shot 200 rebels. And I just changed the words and it became the British militia shot 200 abolitionists. And for me, it totally changed the meaning because of my cultural background, because of the meanings I associate with the words. I'm like, okay, that's really interesting. Let's do that <laughs> and, and see where that would go. And so I did that throughout the, um, the book. And, and, and I think, you know, I think it's interesting what words, the power, words have power. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting being part of that process of challenging the meaning of words. And, and even though they can be awkward at first. Oh. So throughout the book, for example, I put um, quote quotations marks speech marks around things like ownership or property or asset and i can see that as being interruptive for the reader which is i don't want to be into but at the same time these people weren't assets they weren't property they weren't owned how could you say they were owned it's disgusting yeah. so you know these are some of the conversations i try to have well with myself and my editor <laughs> um throughout that's so interesting. I, I wondered if you could say something actually about Gladstone because um, Jack Gladstone, sure. because I was reading a book. Um, I don't know if you came across it. Uh, I can't find the passage. It's a book called um, The Four Pillars by someone called Kenneth Joyce Robertson. Um, mm. I don't know if you've seen this book, but um, one of the things that he argues in this is that he felt that uh, Jack Gladstone was a traitor because he didn't, um, he wasn't armed. He deliberately tried not to hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. And um, because he was exiled rather than executed, I think it's kind of felt that somehow he must've been in with the, um, mm -hmm. the plantocracy. I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how he came to be sent to St. Lucia as opposed to being executed right. like his, his father Kwamena. Yeah, so well, Kwamena wasn't executed, he was shot while he was in hiding. I mean, we, look, we only have the word of this guy called Michael M. Turk, who was one of the nastiest characters of the colony, who somehow 
after this, all, all the dust settled and after slavery was abolished, he somehow got, managed to get knighted by the queen for services towards the enslaved people. You know, he was one of these incredible people who has his eye on history, so he can always come out smelling like roses. Um, but yeah, so Kwame wasn't, he wasn't executed, but he, I mean, he was shot. Um, uh, they said that he was trying to run away, who knows, uh, I doubt it. Um, so, I mean, Jack, Jack, um, talked about the use of nonviolence when, and we have the court trials. This is one of the reasons we know, this is one of the reasons I was so attracted to this story, because this is one of the rare situations where we can actually hear directly from those enslaved, because there were these extensive court martials held after the end of the uprising. We get to hear not only from Jack Gladstone, but scores of other enslaved people, men and women, about the, what happened blow by blow, who was involved, and then also what they said. So we actually get to hear their voices. Now, of course, Often it would be the clerk, a white clerk, who would be writing down their words, so you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful insight. And, you know, Jack tells us, as do other people, that he, they had discussions about this. So it is a, it's an indication of how considered their preparations were. This wasn't some impulsive response. To say, this was weeks and weeks of, of organizing conversation, uh, reaching out to people across the colony, um, I think more than 60 different estates were, were, were reached out to. And, and that's why, as you said at the beginning, the numbers involved, it was the largest uprising of enslaved people in the British Empire. I mean, between at least 12,000, maybe 15,000 people, you know, enormous numbers of people. And the reason, the way they did that was through organizing. And, and to, they kept it secret until the very end. I mean, there was, at the very last minute, there was somebody who, who betrayed them, but into, they really did very well keeping it, which was very hard in itself. But he was committed to nonviolence, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is they'd seen the consequence of suppression of other rebellions, and they'd seen how terrible it could be for those who took part in rebellion. But I also think that he had a genuine, you know, from, from his, his, what he says, what he did, he had a genuine commitment to nonviolence. Uh, he, the, he, was, he was a person full of humanity. Um, you know, you have to read between the lines a bit to pick that up, but that, that's my sense. And so it was both strategic as well as moral, I think, the reason why. Look, he had no idea what the consequences were, um, except for what would be expected, which was death. You know, and, that, and they talked about that. You know, he, as, as, the, as the leader of the uprising, he would have absolutely expected, in fact, he said so, you know, in his court testimony that he expected that they um, he said that he was guilty of organizing the, of the uprising and he fully expected that he'd be put to death. And the reason why he wasn't, you can get to see this in the letter from J John Murray, the governor, back to parliament, to the foreign secretary, to the king. And the reason why they didn't want to kill him, they didn't want to make him a martyr. They wanted him, not in the Demerara, because they didn't want him to cause trouble, but they wanted to get rid of him, but not have him killed. Look, they, they, they executed at least... They, they hanged and executed at least 50 others and then decapitated about 20 of them. I mean, it's to, totally awful just to even talk about it. Decapitated their heads, put them on pikes to warn other people. So they weren't, the, what, the colonists were not scared. They were not reluctant to kill people, to execute people. But they, they, they absolutely made an example of uh, Jack Gladstone because they didn't want him to become a martyr. They didn't want him to become somebody they could, or people could organize around. And they wanted to set an example that if you were somebody who did commit to nonviolence, then you wouldn't be expected to be punished. So as, as a kind of an incentive for other people further down the road. So, but I think, you know, you can't look too much. I mean, you can't look back, you know, be careful as, as somebody who's writing about history is trying to put two and two together, make eight. You know, the fact that he was sent to St. Lucia, which is what we think happened. The fact that he wasn't hung. I don't think that was his intention, you know, and there's absolutely no evidence of him you know, working with the colonists. In fact, the opposite is true. You know, he took great personal risks. He, he, he worked extremely hard uh, with his uh, associates and um, other, other people. So, so no, I've, 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 I haven't seen any evidence say that's true. In fact, the opposite is the true. I think he comes across as, as a remarkable hero, somebody whose name needs to be honored and remembered uh, for, for centuries to come. Um. Thank you for that. And I, I just, there's the kind of leading on from that. I just wanted to um, talk about your, your particular background, actually. Yeah. I, I, when I was looking you up, <laughs> I, 
Juanita, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I realise. Um, Rod obviously thinks I've been talking too much. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, Rod, I was just... so rude. He's so rude. <laughs> um, you'd written a book about your a, a great uncle who was a Lieutenant uh, Hans Alexander. Yeah. Um, a German Jew who post World War Two was a leading member of the uh, British war crimes investigation team that had been charged with hunting down a, a senior Nazi officials. Um, yeah. And obviously, I know your family's uh, your family had fled, fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and that your family subsequently received uh, reparations from Germany. Yeah. Uh, I feel like in the past, a lot of people have been afraid to draw a kind of comparison between the Holocaust mm. and um, slavery. And I just wondered if you could, um, yeah, what your feelings were on that, and and kind of right. what your position is. Yeah. So my so my situation is is my family are German Jewish. Uh, in the uh, 1930s, uh, they uh, had increasing problems. They were in Berlin. My grandmother was kicked out of school. My grand great grandfather lost his. He had this medical practice, and they were forced to flee Nazi Germany. Members of my family were murdered in the Holocaust, and I've written books about that, as you say. You know, when I was in Guyana, uh, people mentioned they made they made a link. They they said, look, if the the victims of Nazi Germany received reparations why shouldn't the descendants of enslaved Africans and I totally understand that question and that point I think it's a very strong argument and you know the the victims in the United States the Japanese uh, people who were rounded up and, and incarcerated in the Second World War they were given uh, reparations um, so you know I, I do think that it's important to be careful to make too many comparisons between atrocities between the Holocaust what happened to the the Jewish people in Europe, what happened to enslaved Africans. Um, I think even even more challenging is to kind of work out which is more you know problematic, which has I think those kind of conversations don't go anywhere. I don't think they're helpful. But I do think there's lessons that can be learned. So in my case, I spoke to a descendant, the granddaughter of the Nazi in Slovenia who deported over 70,000 Jews to the death camps. And I spoke to her and I asked her, you know, what about it? And she said that it was a big secret when she was um, growing up. I wanted to understand more about the legacy within a family, about being in the perpetrator side, what, you know, what to do with that legacy and, and what, what was possible. And, and she said, look, they didn't talk about it. It was a big secret. And when I started asking questions, they kind of were very defensive. And I said, well, did you feel responsible for what your grandfather did? She said, no, no, I can't be responsible. I wasn't alive, but I can be responsible for the silence. And if I don't say anything, then I'm complicit in that. And I found that really helpful. And she's done a lot of work about intergenerational trauma about, and, and talking about the, on the perpetrator side. And, and so, yeah, so that was something which I drew some lessons from. And then when I was talking to my family, because I got into some conversations with my family, because this was very new to members of my family. And then especially after the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests, there was conversations going on in Britain, particularly, and also the states with members of my family I'm talking about. And we had conversations and there was, you know, there was a small number of people who became defensive. You know, how dare you talk about this? You're ruining the reputation of a family. You know, they said, you know, there's so many other issues which are more important to talk about. This thing was 200 years ago, you know, all those things. Um, but the vast majority were like, yeah, we, this is really seriously important. Let's talk about it. Let's acknowledge, let's, let's, let's educate ourselves and talk about what we can do about it. And so when you're asking about making kind of comparisons, I'm very um, nervous about making comparisons, but I think there are lessons that can be learned for sure. And when I was in Guyana, and also here, I heard directly from, from some people who said, you know, who made this point, which I said earlier about, you know, if, 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 the, if the German Jews, if the, if the European Jews receive reparations, why can't the descendants of enslaved Africans? And so I think there are some, I mean, what do you think? I'd like to know what you think. It's something that I've always thought about, um, but haven't dared raise because there tends to be a kind of, I don't know. I always feel like when when anybody raises anything to do with the Jewish community, you have to be so careful in terms of people viewing you as anti-Semitic. But I've sure. never I've never sort of raised it publicly. But I have wondered why um, there hasn't been a kind of not a comparison, but 
just, you know, if the Europeans can accept that that atrocity sure. um, deserved reparations, I've never understood why they then couldn't accept why, right. you know, the enslavement of people didn't deserve the same. You know, and the enslavement of people, but all and, and the death, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean they say at least a third of the people who were transported in the middle of passage died. Well, that's millions and millions of people, oh. you know, let alone the millions of people who were sold into slavery, who suffered extraordinary hardship, the high mortality rates, the sexual violence, mm. families being separated. I mean, it's just appalling, of course, you know. Um, I mean, Tanahisi Coates writes about it, in, if, if you read his article about reparations in the Atlantic, I think it was 2014 or 2015, he makes connections. So there are some people who do talk about this publicly, and I think it's important, and I think it's totally you know, um, I mean, I know Eric Phillips is here today and I, he and I talked about it and I, I think there's, it's, a, it's definitely a legitimate question. I think as well, I mean, one of the things that, that really strikes me is that it's not just about that history of slavery, but it's also about the history of racism and race ideologies and the fact that, right. you know, even post emancipation and you've then got indentureship and then you've got colonization, it's about the fact that actually, Black people have been oppressed um, beyond slavery and are struggling today still because of those ideologies of racism that came about as a result of, or, or of, you know, well, I guess mid Victorian uh, period was the height of uh, race ideologies, but they all seem very connected. And um, so, in a way, I don't just see that reparations is linked to slavery. To me, it's actually linked to that whole history of um colonization and um imperialism as well but i just saw there was a, a comment i think um april louis louis louise sorry she also said i mean she's saying in the comments that we're still not considered human or worthy of dignity respect to terminal reparations and i think for me that's something that's very different because i feel that you know in terms of the jewish community um it wasn't just reparations i mean the british government were very clear that they're not even on this, you know, not even noted on the census in order to prevent, um, you know, everything was done to try and stop anti-Semitism, not just, you know, um, repair for the Holocaust. So I kind of would like to see more done personally about racism as well, you know, racist language. Um, but going back to racism, I was really um, interested in your research. You talked about, um, uh, I think it's Murray, uh, McTurk's book, um, you were saying the racist language in that or, and I'm wondering, I've always sort of thought, I've never expected that you would read a text from that period that wasn't hideously racist, mm. even amongst the abolitionists. And I right. was just wondering, you you spoke about John Cheveley and, and his growth. I mean, does he show any signs of, of, of being racist? Or would you say there were people from that period who were capable of being racist or anti-racist? There was definitely people who were capable of being anti-racist, but they were in the minority. So even um, the majority of the abolitionists, you know, I mean, um, Ibram Kendi talks about that in his book, Stamp from the Beginning, and I recommend it if, if you haven't read it, oh. Stamp from the Beginning. And um, he talks about, he has this term, which is uh, uh, a racist, anti -slave, or anti-slavery racist. You know, so the, he said that most of the enlightened men and women were racist as you say, and it was very common. So, and, and I was very confused by, until he kind of worked it out for me, I was very confused because John Smith is clearly anti-slavery, but he's also clearly racist. I mean, disgustingly racist. And I was like, how does that even work? And, and, and Kendi was very helpful. He just, that, you know, that is just very, that was very common, as you said. And it, uh, I mean, Thomas Jefferson, I mean, I was at uh, Monticello just a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to be at his house. And you know, this is the man who, who wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. And yet he himself owned, in quote marks, over 600 enslaved people. And he wrote a book, Notes on Virginia, which is shockingly racist, you know, talking about white people being superior to black people in, in terms of, you know, being fearful of revenge if you emancipate those enslaved. I mean, really disgusting stuff. And, and I was actually quite moved because there was, a, there was a woman who took us on what they called a slavery tour, and she was standing just a few steps from Thomas Jefferson's house and telling us this. So not just the good stuff, but also the bad stuff. So I think, you know, it is possible, it takes a little bit more effort, but to have a more complex view of some of these characters. You know, they can be flawed, 
um, they can have contradictory, in our eyes, contradictory personalities, characteristics. They can do contradictory things. In terms of Chivoli, I think his is one of the most interesting stories because you see his narrative art. You can see how he actually grows and develops. And I think by the time he gets back to Britain, after he's had this experience in Demerara, he is genuinely a changed man. I mean, not changed enough that he didn't apply for compensation after slavery was abolished for the enslaved men and women who were again owned by his, his wife's family. So, you know, when it came to money, <laughs> you know, people, you know, people's morals often went out or their ideology went out the window, you know. So again, that's quite interesting. You see that, you know, there's a kind of a public side and there's a private side. I think you see that again and again over history, don't you? Absolutely. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to raise again today um, as well was just the, I love that there's the history and then that you have the kind of reflections. So your contemporary reflections on it oh. and the way that through that we get to see there's a lot of people who are involved in the process of creating your book right i think right. it's really interesting because we often think about oh a book is by somebody and the name is on the spine right. but it felt like that was a really important thing to you it was incredibly important you know and uh, when i was in when, again, when I was in Guyana, Elsie Harry said this to me, you know, we're sick of these white Europeans coming in and stealing all our history and then going back and writing books. And, and I think that's, again, that's a fair point. It's a fair criticism. And it was very important to me, partly to give credit where credit was due, but also as a storyteller to involve and include and reveal the process of writing the story, you know, to see how it, the sausage is made. And also, maybe most importantly, um, to hear from voices who know much more about this subject than I do. And I'm so happy to have some of these incredible people today to, um, where we can hear from them soon, I hope. And, and because, you know, I, I learned so much and it was, it, you're absolutely right. It was definitely a group effort. You know, obviously I take responsibility for the book, but it was certainly a group effort. And I stand, on, stand I stood on the shoulders of so many other people in the writing of the book. Thank you. No, we'll definitely go on uh, soon. I think I've just got two more questions um actually one is is comes from john mayer so and i, I th the reason i uh, talked earlier about your uh, great uncle is that i was interested in that juxtaposition between you know your family receiving reparations but also yeah. then having been involved in um yeah. in, through indirectly involved in slavery so um and john mayer says i am a white guyanese my Guyanese great-great-grandfather was a plantation and slave owner. My great-grandfather on my Scottish father's side labored as a riveter in the shipyards of the west of Scotland for decades. Hmm. His ancestors had been driven from the highlands by the clearances. Um, from whom should I claim reparations for these acts of cruelty? And I, I, I'm bringing up this question because it's something I hear a lot from yeah, the sure. people who are very defensive yeah, <laughs> about appreciate. the issue of reparations. And I, I wondered if yeah. you could respond to that. Yeah. And also, I think um, just to mention, David Alston is also in the room. Yeah. Um, and David, I know, talks a lot about um, the Highland clearances and kind of... So maybe David might want to come in after you, but yeah, if you could sure. Uh, respond. Sure. So th this is something that's raised a lot. Um, one of the criticisms of, of reparations, especially of, of white people taking responsibility is, what about the white working class? What about people who've only arrived in Britain recently, in recent generations? And the answer that I hear from people in Guyana and also from black activists here in Britain is, if you are white, you have benefited from the wealth that's come to Britain whenever you arrived in Britain. And, and the, at the very least, you need to acknowledge that. At the very least, you need to lean into that and acknowledge that. And then ask yourself what you're going to do about that. Look, talking about reparations for those who are descended from Africans, enslaved Africans, doesn't preclude us from talking about other issues. You know, that's, I mean, that's a very kind of classic kind of argument, the whataboutism. But there is something particularly atrocious about slavery. We're talking about over 15 million people who were captured and dragged across the Atlantic to the Americas, you know, and, and I mean, one of the arguments that the uh, West Indian traders use, the people who were, who either owned the plantations or had the property interests or were the commodities, into commodities, they said the conditions of those who were peasants, they called them peasants in Europe, were as bad as those enslaved. Well, that's just not true. It's, just, it's objectively not true. And, and it's just an argument 
to be used to try and distract from what is a heinous, heinous crime. And I'm not, I don't think it's acceptable. And, and it, it's just one of many defenses or defensive arguments that people use. Sure, lots of people have, have ancestors who had a really terrible, terrible time, including my family, you know, but that doesn't preclude us talking about this large group of people who are treated horrifically, particularly by Britain and particularly by white people. And look, there's nervousness about saying it like that. It's, I, I mean, even when I started saying it, I was, oh, I can I say it? Is it right to say it? Is it, you know, will people be angry with me? And, you know, I don't really want to put my head above the parapet. And certainly as a German Jewish refugee, we're taught not to put our head above the parapet. And I, I, I don't know, I, I felt it was important. And, and uh, I think it's worth saying. No, and, and thank you for saying it because, um, yeah, I just I just thought the book was is so so important. Um, but one of the one of the other aspects of the book I just wanted to clarify was um, the line between history and fiction. So there were part, the parts of the book that I can see it, it's it's rooted in in history and archive, and but then there are other parts that were so much kind of color and detail that I thought, ooh, is some of this kind ooh, of fictionalized, <laughs> you know, is it, is it, yeah. you know, and I wondered if you could say like, sure, yeah, say I something. can talk about that. Mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I've written narrative, what I call narrative nonfiction for over 10 years now. And uh, I am on the nonfiction side, I'm the side of facts and truth. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do is use fictional techniques. So character, arc, color, situation. So for me, I want to know what the weather was like. I want to know what the smells were like. I want to know, um, you know, what, what people were eating. I want to know what kind of cutlery they're eating on. I want to know what they're drinking. And that just takes an enormous amount of research. So everything in the book, there's a source for. And, you know, whether it meant that when I was, it, when it was, I was in Ghana, I went out to the bush and I spoke to some experts, some military experts about how do you survive in the bush for three weeks? And I was very lucky to have somebody, a retired journal, a general who actually said this, if you're going to live in the bush for two or three weeks, this is what you can do. And here's the fish that's available. Here are the animals available. Here's how you get water. You know, so, um, you know, there's, there's definite ways you can get that information. And uh, I think it's really important as a writer to try and kind of make it alive for people. Now, uh, did I make stuff up? No, I totally didn't make stuff up. Did I put two and two together make four? Yes, absolutely. You know, so for example, when Jack Gladstone's in the bush, I would say this is the kind of stuff that he'd be doing because I had this, this you know, really strong source and I'd be looking at botanical textbooks and I'd be looking at the history of the nature of that time and I can kind of create an environment. And if you read carefully the way I did it, you know, sometimes I might put a perhaps or a maybe or would have or could have. And sometimes, you know, it will seem like, you know, I'm inside Jack's head, but if you read the language carefully, I'm not actually in Jack's head. So I'm using some sleight of hand, which is a literary sleight of hand, but, you know, I'll never use words for Jack, for example, that he hasn't said. I would never quote him if I don't know that's what he said or there's a source for it, or, you know, in terms of the color or, you know, the, the kind of the texture of the, of the, of the story. So, um, but what it takes is it takes an enormous amount of research. And I was extremely lucky because we have these, we had memoirs and letters and we had court records and, and the archives and the photographs, the archives in Georgetown are great. The archives in London and the National Archives are great. So I was able to, you know, I'd isolate a moment and then I'd try come out from many different sides. And the remarkable thing is most people remember it the same. So if the Battle of the Bachelor's Adventure, I tell it from Cheveley's point of view, because he wrote about it in his letters. And then I tell about it, tell it from Jack's point of view. But I'm dropping in details, which I picked up from other people who talk about the battle during what they call the battle during the court records. So that's how I kind of fill out the story. Um, but absolutely, no, nonfiction. Yeah, oh. I don't make stuff up. That's just, that's just amazing, because when I read it, it was... First of all, it reads very quickly. I mean, you can read it in like one or two sittings because the language mm. you use is just fantastic. It just speeds through you. it. Um, so it was very readable, very accessible, but um, also really enjoyable. Like you really get sucked into the story. And I just thought that was mm. unusual in a way for history books because most history books are a bit drier. So that's well, why- you I, see, I mean, honestly, that's, that's where I come from. I find most history books really hard to read. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, that's what, that's just, so I, I try to write what I like reading. Uh, for exactly that reason. Well, I take my hat off. I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you saying that. So, 
I guess the other thing which which connects is linked to that and I'm well first of all I'm going to say thank you because I'm going to move on from you to Errol Brewster now um, because one of the things that um, you really wanted that I that I loved was um, you wanted enslaved people to be represented in the book and of course oh. the archives are silent on that mm -hmm. um, and so um, yeah uh, Errol Brewster was charged with with kind of, he was commissioned with creating a kind of visual representation of Jack Gladstone and also of Alma. Um, and it's fantastic having a woman in there as well, which is another, another um, great aspect to the book. Um, I'm wondering if we can all as an audience, just put our hands together to say thank you, um, first of all, and then I'll move on to um, Errol Brewster. So, um, Thank you, Thomas. And Errol, are you around? Can you go on to take your mute off? Here we go. Not hearing I put you. mine on, which wasn't very clever. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me just um, see if I can... I've got you on spotlight, perfect. So you're there. What I want to do, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but I just want to show the audience the image that you created. Um, so yeah, this might be on a timer, actually, but let me just see if I can get it to move. Oh, no, it doesn't work. It does not work. Let's go this way. Let's go this way. Hold on, bear with me. Not there. Ugh. Oh. I hope I hope most of you will have seen it um, on the circular that was going around, but I'm just going to bring it up on this. Let's see. Here we go. That's a bit better. So can everybody? Oh, no. Nope, hang on. Hang on. I hadn't done it. There we go. Finally got there. Um, I'm just going to do that. So what I wanted to um, ask you Errol, I know you, well, actually, first of all, let me, let me just say that you are uh, a son of the soil, Guyanese born, but currently living in um, the United States. And for people who don't know, I'm sure everybody here knows um, you, but um, you've got four decades, essentially, of kind of engaging in multimedia imaging practice. I think that's how you describe it. And um, you've obviously participated in multiple exhibitions, regional and international um, kind of exhibitions, um, Carafestas, uh, the first international triennial uh, Caribbean art, uh, when was that, 2010, something like that. But obviously you're very heavily involved in art, but I wondered if you had, um, how you managed to visualize this character of Jack Gladwell. Well, um, first off, I want to thank you for inviting me to say something about these pictures here. And um, also to thank you and your husband for this, what is very quickly becoming an institution uh, at which Guyanese can come together and speak of things that are important to us. So um, in terms of the nitty-gritty of these pictures now, I want to thank Thomas too for um, acknowledging these pictures, for liking them and wanting to use them. Um, portraiture, which is something that I do a lot of, is basically I, done by eye-hand coordination. And by that, I mean that essentially what it is that is required of you is that you accurately record what you keenly observe in material reality. This project, however, there was nothing to be looking at. <laughs> uh, and so I had to figure out how am I going to come up with what Thomas wants and enlivening of this, uh, bringing to life of these historical figures. And so I, I referred to the text, um, uh, blood, Tears of Blood and Crowns of Glory by Emilia Viotti da Costa. I got this, in fact, from you. Sent several pages of this text in which you highlighted parts of it that referred to Jack. And so I read through them all. But it didn't yield very much um, physical description. I said that he was a young man of about 30, that he was well built, that he was handsome. But that was about all. It gave one specific detail that he was six feet, two inches. So I knew immediately that his head was a foot. 
in that, people are uh, proportioned in a ratio of about one to six. Being six feet two, he's 12 feet 72, plus two, 74, divided by six. His head is roughly 12 inches. So his head is a foot. He gave you a good kick with his head. <laughs> so that set me up to understand how to position him in the, in the frame that I'm going to image him. Now, as I read further on, it referred to his father, Kwamina, and you, I, I, I'm not sure if it's you or the text, uh, made it clear that Kwamina was a Ghanaian, that he was from North Africa. He, he was, he was from me, the um, Akan tribe. Yes, you told me that he was from the Akan tribe and that these people were fine featured. They had an ennoblement about them. So this is corroborated in the text in which Jack is described as having a European aspect. It is not a European aspect at all. It is that he is Akan and they are fine featured people. So he has a straight nose. So I have certain things already. He has a big head. He has an ennoblement. He's a stout figure. He has a straight nose. And as I read further on, it comes out that he um, he is he enters into all of his undertakings with full heart and hand. So he's earnest and he is conscientious. And so my task is becoming one of a kind of a reverse engineer. Ordinarily, we would look around at people and from their appearance, we would deduce something about their character or personality. Here, I'm doing the opposite. I am reading from the reports in the book about his interactions with others and discerning what his personality and, and characteristics are. So I, <coughs> I learned that um, he's very determined, uh, that he's very much loved by women. In fact, he's an embarrassment to his father, his dalliance with all the women all over. He, because he's an artisan, he is sent to various other plantations to do technical works. So he has a degree of freedom. And with this freedom, everywhere he goes, he picks up a girlfriend or two. He also has two wives. <laughs> so what is it that is drawing these women to Jack? What do women like in a man? Here we're talking about the physiognomy of a man. We're not talking about his other parts. <laughs> so what do women like? Women like powerful men. Women like men who are sensitive. Women like men who are, who, who, who are able to be decisive. So these are all things that are giving me clues as to what Jack should look like. So I decided he must have square jaw, he must have a prominent chin. I put a dimple because I know women love that. He's because he's sensitive, he has soft but penetrating eyes. And what frames eyes and draw them, make them more noticeable than anything else? Eyebrows and eyelashes. So he has thick eyebrows, and long eyelashes. Uh, hmm. So this is how I am arriving at what Jack looks like. And so I scatter the, he's made of 101 dots. And the next question that people like to ask artists is, how long does it take you to do this? Well, each of you can time yourself how long it takes you to make a dot. You can multiply by 100. And I think you will come out with about 40 years, nine months, four weeks, three days, 23.9 hours. That's how long it took. That's how long I've been doing this. So the task of, uh, of, of creating Jack meant that he had to have a stout body. He had to have enough. You know, they, they, they said that he struck uh, Europeans, that he was, a, Europeans found him to be a striking man. So, well, you know, in that time and to an extent now, the impression that Europeans harbor in their mind of black people is so low that they, you, they render you virtually invisible. So for Jack to be seen as striking must mean that he had a tremendous presence and aura about him. So those are the things that clued me into what he should look like. I did the same thing with Abner, um, a woman apart. She was the leader of men. She marched several men down miles along the oh, coast. You're talking about arrive, Alma now, right? Yes. So arrive at um. At the, at the overseer's house where they're standing in a seating silence, waiting for him to crack open, crack open the door. And when he does, he encounters tall, thin. These African women, when they're young, she was, I think she was about 23, they're like broomstick. Not much in front or behind, broomstick. <laughs> what the Europeans would call lissom. But um, she's strong, gangly, tall, narrow shoulders, long neck. Her hair stands up hard and high on her head, like 
they're like um, warriors in battle. Big baleful eyes confronts this overseer when he cracks open the door, his whip fell out of his hand. So um, he has these warriors behind, silently behind her, and she orders his arrest and intends to order his execution. But the men, you know how black people are. You can do them a hundred and one things and they'll forgive you. This is true of Jack also. The man who detained, arrested and detained Jack, he spared his life and the life of several others. Black people are like that, very forgiving. Abner, however, is intent on executing this man, but the warriors prevail on her. And so she decides to send him to where he sends people for the stocks. I'm discerning all of this from the text that you sent me. So in a, in a word, I came to make these portraits to give them life, give life to these uh, historical figures by a kind of reverse engineering. I read in the text, discerning how their personality and characteristics are and attributing that, those things to how, to what visual representation might suggest. Because we all do this. You walk into a bank and you look around and you very quickly decide, he looks like a vagabond. He looks like he'll throw rocks. He looks like an intellectual. He looks like a troublemaker. We are doing this out of, nobody's reading any police reports. Nobody's reading any resumes. We are doing this from sheer an understanding and interpretation of what's going on in people's face. So I reversed that process and here they are. <laughs> They're very powerful, um, Errol. Just so, yeah, so thank you for, for doing thank that. You. And it, it's really <laughs> refreshing to actually see black faces represented in, in a history of um, Atlantic slavery. So, so yeah, thank you. Um, I think this this initiative that, um, that 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 Thomas took in wanting to have these people imaged is one that we can take a little further. You know, in Guyana and the Caribbean, Barbados has done a lot in this regard. They have big, large mural portraits of people who are significant in their history. We should do the same. You know, the Bank of Guyana building and the Pegasus and the Lamaha Canal where the where the, the farmers used to do subsistence farming that all went to bush, that, that should become a, a parade of, um, a, a walk of fame, you know, where we put large murals of all of the significant people in, in, in our long history of resistance. These things, you know, image has a way and it has been used image for millennia to focus and concentrate people's attention uh, it, the, the image can convey complex, abstract ideas of ideology in a flash and across vast distances and across vast amounts of time. Image is a very strong and important thing, and we really ought to use it more. No, and I, I think I think sometimes um, we make the mistake as well of thinking that the representations we have of the Europeans are accurate themselves, because obviously the people who are plantation owners are trying to make themselves look extra grand, trying to make themselves look extra powerful in their own images. So they're probably not like necessarily true mirror representations of themselves, but actually again, kind of conceptual representation of themselves. So it works perfectly well within this kind of context to, to build on, on, on you know, this idea of imagining based on historical, um, the resources that we do have. Um, so yeah, I think it's very powerful. Um, so thank you, Errol. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on now. I don't know if um, Alyssa is in the house. Uh, she may not be. Um, I'm here. You are. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> I hadn't mm -hmm. seen you. I hadn't seen your name pop up. So, um, but yeah, I wanted to bring you in because Thomas had told me that you'd been. Um, very involved and he, had, he felt that your contribution had been indispensable. So I just wondered if you could talk to us about, you know, maybe how you worked with him and, and you know, what did you, what, what sort of things did you actually contribute to the book? Um, thank you so much, uh, Winita and Rod, for inviting me here today. And thanks so much for all the amazing work you're doing with Guyana Speaks. Thomas is very generous and exaggerates here because he spoke with you guys and I know you connected him with a number of people, most importantly, Errol, for this incredible set of images. And tomorrow, as folks on the call, many of you will know, I edit a weekly newspaper column in the Stabrook News called the Diaspora Column um, that attempts to offer 
a, a different sort of um, you know um, outlet for conversations aside from what you would usually find in the rest of the Guyanese newspapers, which is pretty distressing these days. But tomorrow's diaspora column is actually dedicated to this book, and Thomas has actually written um, the column for tomorrow that will be coming out. So I, I'll, I'll just say a few words. I don't know that I would characterize it as working with Thomas so much as it was um, a set of conversations that he had with me as a point of departure for being connected with a number of Guyanese inside and outside of the country. And I first wanted to begin by congratulating Thomas for um, just telling a great story. I took this, you know, the advanced copy of the book with me over the holidays and read it in, in one sitting. So for folks who haven't had an opportunity to get this book as yet, whether you agree with everything in it or not, it's just a beautifully told story. And so I just wanted to begin by congratulating Thomas for that and to let him know that I left it with my father, which is you know a, a huge commendation for me to recommend something to my dad to read. Um, Thomas and I began speaking perhaps a little over a year and a half ago. Um, he'd reached out to me and um, before we talked, I, you know, um, decided to go look him up like you did, Juanita, and, um, you know, went through several of his books. Actually, my first, uh, the first thing I found was a, a really deeply moving account in The Guardian. And that was actually the connection with Thomas began with this story I read about the, 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 the really shocking and tragic loss of his son, Katie, and um, a cycling accident. Um, and Thomas wrote a book about it, Katie and Journal. Thomas, I'm sorry to sort of put you on the spot there emotionally, but, but that was actually the original connection um, with Thomas about that, that kind of loss, having gone through a bit of a loss um, of my brother a few years ago as well. Um, and then I, I looked at his other books, um, House by the Lake, which was the, you know, the story of his family and, and their relationship to Nazi journey, um, Germany and the Holocaust, and then Legacy, One Family, A Cup of Tea, and the company that took on the world. And it was clear to me that you know, Thomas begins with these personal and familial connections as a way of opening up to these larger histories and larger um, questions and, and difficult stories. And, and that this was kind of the approach that he was choosing to tell, having discovered that his own family's relationship to tobacco had connections with the um, transatlantic slave trade, particularly in the United States. But that this would be a different kind of story because the story that he chose to tell in relation to this wasn't one that uh, directly implicated his family. He would have had to go to the American South to do that, but that implicated him um, as a white person in relation to thinking about um, the way in which whiteness um, is, is one of the indispensable um, um, pieces of the puzzle in relation to racial capitalism and the ongoing effects of that in our contemporary society. So in a sense, the project was the same as what I saw as Thomas's earlier approaches, beginning with something personal and then moving up to these larger questions and somewhat different in that he chose a story that implicated himself as a white person, but not a story that was directly connected to his own family. So we ended up around having lots of conversations around history, around how you tell stories, around questions of power around imperialism and white supremacy. Um, we had several conversations around the fact that, you know, for Black people, this is not a new story. Like, this is not, not a new story. This is something that Black folks have carried and lived in and, and know, and we walk with those legacies in contemporary society. What does it mean to, to contemplate um, those realities? And what does it mean that we live in a world where some folks can actually afford to walk through the world without having to pay direct attention? Um, to, to, to those kinds of questions. Um, and then how to tell the story. And I think what I was really struck with all the way through was Thomas's deep commitment to telling the story. Um, and, you know, I would send one email. I was telling my partner today, I would send one email and Thomas would send 50 more queries. It was very exhausting, um, but always deeply interested in asking who are the protagonists? Who should he speak to? Um, how is he himself as a white person implicated in this? And that's the commentaries that you spoke about, um, Winita, that were scattered throughout the book. We did have some conversation because there was much more of Thomas's family in earlier drafts. And after conversations with you and Matthew Smith, the his Jamaican historian, myself and others, he decided to take some of that out and ensure that this story always kept the focus on the enslaved abolitionists, on Jack Gladstone, Kwamina Alma and, and others. And, you know, you, it, it was wonderful hearing um, Errol just speak just now and the way in which which he imaginatively recreated these likenesses of Jack Gladstone 
and, and Alma. And, you know, Thomas spoke in his comments there about this difference between fact and fiction. I'm putting a link in for folks. The Nobel Prize winning writer, Toni Morrison, has this most beautiful essay called The Sight of Memory, when she says, the difference is not between fact and fiction. It's between fact and truth. The white people put what they wanted to put into the archives. They made shit up. Jack Gladstone is not the name of that man whose likeness Errol has reproduced. That is a name the white people gave this African that they uprooted, enslaved. So that name you find in the archive, and it's funny, Thomas had sent me a document and I, Thomas, I don't know if you remember, and you were like, look at the name of one of these prisoners and the owner is Trotz. So that, that prisoner, that enslaved prisoner would have been my ancestor but Trotz is the Dutch name that I have. It's not the African name. So, you know, so one is not even clear what part of Africa he comes from. So, so the archives themselves tell a particular story from the point of view of those in power. What is incredible about the Demerara Slave Rebellion is that you had these core testimonies, not because they were interested in what Africans had to say, but because at the time it served the interests of those in power in the same way that the Canadian, incredible Trinidadian Canadian poet and, and cultural producer Nurbezi has done this incredible um, book, Zong, which is about the, the ship that goes down. And the only reason that we know that Africans were thrown overboard was that there was an insurance claim. We don't know about it because anyone cared about Black people. We know about it because the evidence emerges because the white folks were trying to get insurance for the Africans that they threw overboard in order to save the ship. So I think it's really incredible, this difference between fact and fiction and fact and truth and that what Thomas is going after is trying to think about other ways to tell the story in a way that foregrounds the aspirations and the dreams and the actions of the enslaved abolitionists. So even trying to think about what kinds of verbs, what kinds of nouns do we use, the conversations we had about don't use slave, use enslaved, because, you know, to be enslaved is to have something done to you. Slave suggested this is a, you know, to use a fancy word, an ontological property of Black people, that somehow you're naturally a slave, whereas enslaved is something that is done. And then, you know, Thomas's long discussion about this term and slave abolitionist, which I think was a very important move. And I myself was unsure at the time because I'm not a historian, um, but he spoke with Renita. I know he consulted with Matthew Smith and others. So this was, I think, really important is Thomas's spirit of consultation. And, you know, it was Major General Joe Singh. I was fortunate to have been part of that conversation um, because we had connected Thomas with John Piggott, um, who is incredible, Prince, Prince um, Edward of Alexandertown, um, a, a, amazing um, um, in terms of his knowledge, but he connected us with Joe Singh and Major General gave this fantastic sort of discussion of what would have been the plants in the back dam and what would they have um, how would they have hidden and how would they have wrapped themselves in animal hides and all of this sort of information that that sort of became a basis for Thomas to have these sections of the book. So speaking with folks like John Piggott, Major General Joe Singh, Kibri Copeland, who's on the call today, Elsie Henry. So also, you know, what I really appreciated was Thomas finding young people, new generations who are interested and in actively participating in these kinds of questions. That's really important. I'll just end by saying, you know, it's important for us to think about why this matters. If we think about not just the history and the, these incredible atrocities, but think of the contemporary legacies of slavery, of indentureship, of indigenous dispossession of the Atlantic slave trade, those contemporary legacies of anti-Black racism as it plays itself out today in terms of comp contemporary disparities worldwide, in terms of health, in terms of education. Um, and we see this particularly around the pandemic. And I'm grateful as well that Thomas speaks to this in the book where he talks about the importance of this moment. You know, uh, in our parts of the world, we think about this moment in relation to George Floyd, the roads must fall struggles in, in South Africa. Um, we think about the toppling of the statue of the Bristol merchant, Edward Colston. I live in Canada on the, on the lands of the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This is a country in which we've also seen this come to, come to light in the, in the last few years, in particular, the attempt right here in Toronto to rename Ryerson University, which is named after Egerton Ryerson, who was one of the advocates of the residential school movement. 
um, which consigned indigenous children to cultural genocide. And then the huge sort of debate in this country around Henry Dundas that was, you know, um, spearheaded by my colleague and great friend, um, the Barbadian historian, Melanie Newton. Henry Dundas was actually a Scottish politician. I see David Alston on the call here, who was part of the 18th century British parliamentary debates on the slave trade. And actually in the last four or five months, um, the Toronto City Council has agreed to rename one of the most famous streets in Toronto, Dundas, which is named after this Scottish man who many have said have, you know, led to the delay of the abolition of the British slave trade. He never actually visited Canada. And perhaps in the Q&A, Thomas could reflect, because Thomas then decided to take up because he found out, for instance, as well, not Henry Dundas, but John Murray, who was the governor at the time of the Demerara Slave Rebellion has places named after him in Canada. And Thomas has decided to open up these questions in a Canadian context and I believe is working with some black folk out in Niagara to raise the question of renaming. We can think about this in the context of the parade grounds in Guyana. This is not something just about or for or with black folk. This is all of our history. And so that's the last point I wanna say is that when anyone says, you know, why is Thomas doing this? I think we're all implicated. And this, um, the title of the book, Why Debt, really says this. We're all implicated in different and uneven ways. This story is for white people to know. It's for white people to tell. It's for us to think about how whiteness is, uh, is, has, has benefited, um, is con constituted precisely by these historical inequalities. And, and, and as well to say that this is not the last time this story will be told. This is not the only story that will, will be told. Um, to recognize the folks who have been doing this work on the ground and one of the ongoing legacies of white supremacy, and, and Thomas will acknowledge this as well, is the fact that Thomas writes this book. Cecilia McCalmont and Winston McGowan and other historians in the Caribbean have been doing this work on Guyana for decades, but they don't have access to the publishing and distribution and circuits um, that someone like, like Thomas would have, right? So even that is, that's not Thomas's to carry, but it's certainly one of those ongoing uneven legacies. And, and I'm glad that in his own way, Thomas has sought to bring those historians and others into this book, into conversation as a way of amplifying the work and the voices of those who continue to do this work and the, the, the Black folk who continue to go on and do this work. So for folks who want to follow up, make sure you pick up CLR James's Black Jacobins. Last year, the um, historian Vincent Brown published an absolutely amazing, this is the one thing, you know, um, Jack Gladstone may not have fought or chosen violence, but Violence is also part of what it means to be at struggle for justice if you have no other alternatives. And I would highly recommend Taki's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war written by the African-American historian Vincent Brown that came out last year from Harvard University Press as well. And in addition, the other stories to be told, the stories by and of women, whether it is Alma, what would it mean to center her story or her narrative or to try this. to take that kind of approach throughout? That would be important. Or to think of someone like the, the wonderful historian, the Guyanese historian, Nicole Burroughs, who writes about African and Indian men, women and children 100 years later, taking up these rebel questions in the context of Guyana and what it would mean, therefore, to put those questions of gender squarely on the table. Because if you look, for instance, at the CARICOM reparations 10 point plan, the, the word women, the word gender doesn't appear once when in fact, these are absolutely central questions. This is not to put Eric Phillips on the spot, but simply to say there are so many other stories to tell. So I wanna thank Thomas. It has been a wonderful conversation that we've had over the last year and a half and to encourage everyone to get a copy of this book. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. That's just, that was very powerful. And, um, I, 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 yeah, I, can, I can see why Thomas said you had to be involved. <laughs> yeah, no, that was brilliant. I was actually gonna, I, let me just get rid of whoever's making the noise. I'm just gonna mute everyone for the time being and then bring you back mute all. There you go. And then unmute you again. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, what um, you felt was was the value of Thomas's book um, to the debates, the reparations debate. I mean, you kind of you've kind of already uh, indirectly kind of um, explained that. But I wonder if you could say a bit more. I mean, how significant is his use of language in terms of changing it from enslaved abolitionists? 
uh, ch changing the name to enslaved abolitionists. That felt incredibly powerful to me, but I, I just wondered what you felt in terms of, um, you know, how it, how it um, adds to the reparations debate, the book. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the naming is really important, you know, Walter Rodney and others used to cite this um, African proverb that until the lions have their own storyteller, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And that's also the point I was making about the archives, right? The archives are always told. There's an amazing historian called Michel Rolf Trio who wrote a book, Power and the Production of History, that talks about what you find in the archives. There's, there's something that happened. And then we always have to tell the story of what happened. And at each part of that, at each part of that process, power comes into the picture. Power comes into the picture to, to determine what is an archive and what goes into the archive. Power enters the picture at the point at which someone decides to tell the story and whose side you tell the story from. And so I think this book is, is, is really important for a number of reasons in terms of putting the questions of reparations squarely on the table, because what it does is, is, is really say quite centrally that, you know, slavery is, is not just something that happened in the past and is done. It has a way, because you know, Christina Sharp, the, the, you know, the, um, the scholar based here at York University says, these legacies continue to resonate in the contemporary period. They produce all kinds of inequalities between countries, between communities, between people. And that these ongoing inequalities get reproduced in a way that we need to talk about that we need to understand that, you know, <laughs> Jack Gladstone, the, the, the white folk he was named after, you know, the man's son becomes the prime minister of England, right? These, and these things have transnational reverberations. These folks get reparations from slavery. They enslave, mutilate, um, rape, um, distort the lives of folks they take from Africa, and then they get compensated, right? Haiti has to compensate white folks for their independence. And, and those are the inequalities that get reproduced. They are the ones who get compensated. That helps to produce the disparities in wealth that we continue to see today. I think these are the, the these are the, you know, I, I was going to say something and I just lost my train of thought, but these are the, um, these are the crucial things that we need to face. And I think it is really courageous for Thomas um, to say as a white person, as I said, you know, there was one time, I don't know if you remember, Thomas, we had this conversation and you had a line about now our journey of healing can begin. And I think I was pissed and I wrote you back and I said, what do you mean journey of healing can begin? White, black people all, always knew this shit. So this is not as if this is going to begin for us, but I understood what you were trying to say. And I think for Thomas as a white person to say, this is how we need to begin to open up the question of who has benefited so that we can have conversations about what reparations must and should look like. And that reparations has to be structural change, right? And, and those are larger questions that we can't get into. It would be great to have a whole debate on reparations here. Those are larger questions that we can't get into. But bottom line is, you know, reparations for slavery has to fundamentally be a conversation about capitalism. It has to be fundamentally a conversation about a global economic system that is not just related to Britain. It's not just related to Guyana. I mean, if you just take the example of the, the, the reparations that, you know, and at the time of the reparations at the point of abolition of slavery, Guyana was one of the colonies that was one of the richest minefields for reparations going to the British, right? Those are the reparations that, for example, um, helped power the financing that creates the um, the railway that is the sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure that governs Canadian nationalism, mm. the Canadian Pacific Railway, without which you would not have Canada, much of the investment from that comes from the banks that profited off of the transatlantic slave trade. So these are the transnational worlds that, that have been made by slavery, that have been made on the back of enslaved and indentured folks on the backs of indigenous dispossessed folks. And I think calling that to account and opening that up is really crucial. And I think that's where Thomas, um, by saying as a white person, he's not saying, you know, black folk could say black folk, we're the ones to tell our story and our experience with slavery. Thomas isn't saying you're not. What Thomas is saying is that this is also my history and I have a relationship to it and I must be accountable to it. And that's what we need to reckon with.
That's yeah. a long answer. So I'll stop now because I know others have to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And and um, yeah, I think it's really important to say it's it's our history. Yeah, I think that's, you know, we need to write our story, but of course, so does um, so does Thomas. And I think just in terms of the legacy of slavery, I mean, we see that people were transported from Africa to the Caribbean. And then again, you know, under the British Nationality Act of 1948, invited to come to Britain. And then now we've got the Windrush scandal. I mean, if there wasn't a more direct example of ways in which black people continue to be oppressed because of it, um, that is one of them for sure. Um, I want to move now to Eric Phillips. So if I could just ask everybody to thank you so much for um, sharing uh, your thoughts with us and talking to us about your involvement in the book. Uh, Alyssa, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Eric, if you're there, I'm going to just take the spotlight off Alyssa. Um, gosh, okay, so here we go. Is the spotlight off? And you're here. Spotlight for everyone. So I can see you. Fantastic. Um, so, of course, you were involved very much in the book, too, and I know that um, you're the chairman of the Guyana Reparations Committee. Um, yeah, I just wanted you to talk really about how you see reparations. I mean, is it is it money? What is it? What is it that um, the Guyana Reparations Organization would like to see happen? Thanks, Renita, for hosting this program. Hi, Thomas. Uh, I haven't read the book, but congratulations based on all the reviews I've heard. Reparations for us means many different things. It's both, I'll use the, the terminology, hardware and software. The hardware, of course, is financial reparations. And of course, without that, Caribbean civilization is at risk. Um, the legacies of slavery in the Caribbean are so dramatic and so every day, um, huge debts, illiteracy, health problems. Barbados is the amputation capital of the world. Um, if you look at the economies, if you look at climate change, how Caribbean countries are at risk, without reparatory justice, Caribbean civilization is, is at risk. So from the point of view of financial reparations, um, it is critical for the Caribbean, regardless of how you look at it. And reparations are just. Um, if you look at the legacies in the Caribbean, um, people will argue that everyone else has gotten repartory justice, but people in the Caribbean. And if you look at England, I mean, people seem to forget that there were 46,000 Britons that benefited from, from slavery. They owned slaves, 46,000 Britons. It wasn't just companies and individuals, it was the church, it was women. So British society dramatically benefited. If you look at the Jews, um, they received repartory justice. And there were 6 million Jews who um, were in the Holocaust. Well, slavery was a much bigger Holocaust. If you look at history, in 1600, uh, there were 100 million people in Africa, 100 million people in Europe. By 1850, Europe grew to 270 million. Africa declined to 95 million. So 165 million people are, 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 are missing in history. And if you look at the Berlin Conference and the ramifications of um, colonization, whose gateway was slavery, you, you can see that. So that's one side. And there are numbers that we can argue and calculate, et cetera. On the other side, um, reparations is also about self-healing because of racism, because of how Africans now see themselves, um, how they want to bleach their skin, how they treat each other, how they won't go into business with each other, how they won't tr trust each other. There's a large part that has to do with that. The dilemma with that is that we are caught up with religions that are companions or, or partners with the enslavers. And, and that religion, which is trickled down into our education, um, has damaged us significantly. Um, so you look at the impacts, they're psychological, they're generational, they're emotional, they're economical, they're spiritual. And, and so repartory justice is, is, a, is a big, much bigger issue. It, it has to capture both, as I said, the hardware and the software. Um, thank you for that. So what, what kind of activities are you currently involved in, in terms of 
uh, raising the profile of, of reparations as something that needs to happen? Well, the Karkin Reparations Commission, um, many things are happening. Last year, there was an Africa Union or Caribbean heads of state meeting um, for the first time ever. And so CARICOM is engaging the African Union as a partner in trying to set up um, a framework of discussion with European nations on reparations. So that actually is going on. Of course, the climate change discussion is sort of um, mushing up the issue of reparatory justice because climate change now seems to be a more pressing issue and the issue of reparatory justice seems to be being pushed off. And of course, with COVID, that's another issue. Um, but we've been also been looking at a Marshall Plan. You know, Europe received the Marshall Plan. You could say the Jewish, Jews received the Marshall Plan. So there's discussion about putting together an uh, international development revolving fund that will be contributed by companies and individuals and governments in Europe so that Caribbean countries can have some sort of financial architecture to get themselves out of the huge debt, out of the poverty, out of the youth unemployment, out of the health issues. So that's also what's going on. There's also discussion, and this happened last week, of bringing Queens and Kings of Africa to the Caribbean for a journey so that there's this cultural linkage. Um, there's supposed to be a conference in um, Panama in which kings and queens would come to discuss atonement. We have said in the Caribbean that we are not part of that because there's nothing to atone about, that we, we seem to be confusing ourselves about what happened in history. It wasn't the African kings that sold people into slavery, also some tribes did. It was the British and the Europeans who came and use force in many ways, who provided guns and who provided the trading architecture for slavery to be encouraged and be involved. So those things are going on at the Caribbean level. At the Guyana level, of course, you know the Amerindian Act of 2006 is a repertory justice act that today has given Amerindians 18% of Guyana. They've given them an Amerindian Development Fund. They've given them a Tushaus Council and a ministry. We also know for a fact and our historians have failed us that three of the nine Amerindian groups were not here before Africans were brought here, the YYs, the Makusis, and the Wapishanas. We also know that 473,000 Africans died to build Guyana. So we're looking at that to figure out what needs to be done because the impact is significant. If you look at oil today, African Guyanese are not participating in oil because they don't have the generational wealth as a platform to be involved in local con and to get large contracts. That is an impact. Um, if you look at Guyanese history, you'll see that all other groups have been affirmed, whether it's the Amerindians or Indians or Portuguese or Chinese, they have been affirmed, but Africans have not been affirmed. So if, are you gonna ignore the fact that there's gonna be a widening gap in, of inequality if African Guyanese do not get reparations from the government of Guyana in the same way that Amerindians got repartory justice from the government of Guyana? So there are a lot of these issues. But before I, I close out, I wanna, offer a comment. I haven't read the book. I hope to read it. Um, I am uncomfortable with the words enslaved abolitionists because um, it, to me it's an oxymoron. Um, I prefer the word freedom fighters because that's who they are. When you're abolitionists, it gives you a different connotation in the context of the global use of the word. And as much as I understand Thomas's intent, and I know where his heart is, and I really appreciate what he's done. I think this terminology will add more confusion to the debate. Now, who is an abolitionist? Up to now, abolitionists have been defined in the context of Europeans and the church helping to bring about an end to slavery. So when you juxtapose those connotations and that historical context with enslaved enslavement, I, I think, for me, I have difficulty. Perhaps when I read a book, I'll change my mind. But, but that's just my comment. Because it, the church was involved in abolition, but everybody should know that it was the church who first authorized and legitimized slavery through the papal bulls that the Catholic Church did in 1452, which was dum divorces in 1455, Romanus Pontifus, and in May 1493 was intercriteria. So it's good to have this debate. It's good to have more books. 
but I think we have to be very clear that we do not confuse terminology and deflect the fact that we should be focused on repertory justice, that crimes are committed, horrible crimes, and that the impacts are so devastating today that we see it, whether it's climate change and the exposure of all the Caribbean islands to all this carnage that's going to happen because of global warming, whether it's the health situation, whether it's poverty, whether it's unemployment, and the huge debts. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to um, look at a full picture of what has happened in Africa, in the Caribbean, in England, and the fact that others were given repertory justice. And there seems to be an internalized resistance by many people, even though they have the facts, to repertory justice to people of African descent and people in the Caribbean. Thanks for that, um, Eric. I, I put a comment in the um, slaves to be obedient to your masters in the chat, and I just thought that probably looks really weird. But it was off the back of you saying um, about the Bible and how the Bible then reinforced slavery um, through its teachings. And that was that's the thing that's always stuck in my head is that passage that says slaves be obedient to your masters. It's like I could never ascribe to the you know, everybody has their, their religious beliefs, but that's always been a sticking point for me. Um, I, I wanted to ask you before you go, how, how far do you think we, you know, when are we likely to get reparations? Is there any kind of sense that we're getting, moving forward with the debate or that the West is still kind of closed off to it? The West is closed off it. And you could see from the COVID situation, how closed off this, the inequalities in the world. If, if you can't give vaccines to people around the world and you're, you're taking 2,000% of your population, you could see the attitude. Um, I was just in Evanston, Illinois, where locally repertory justice was done, where they've asked the local government to provide funds so that people who are impacted by enslavement can now buy houses. I think repertory justice will start at the local level. I don't think the Europeans are willing to first of all accept the fact that this was a criminal enterprise and they benefited from it and that their industries and their whole society have been based on criminal enrichment. So just because of that, they'll find all sorts of other issues not to come to the table. So regardless of the leverage that we may believe we have, I don't think the European nations are going to be willing. And unless Guyana and other Caribbean countries are willing to give themselves repertory justice locally as an example. I think the morality of asking the British who are unwilling to give repertory justice, the morality just isn't there. Mm. It's a global uh, movement, it will increase, but diplomatically nothing is gonna happen and economically nothing is gonna happen because you don't want to accept the fact that your whole society is based on criminal enrichment. Um, I, I have one last thought in my head. I wasn't going to ask you, but I, I, I think I, I might, I will, in that I worry about what the discussion around reparations does for racial unity within within Guyana. I mean, how does how does the discussion around Africans and, and people who were indentured um, laborers themselves, and also, you know, obviously the Amerindians were also kind of um, coerced into acting as uh, militia and people like that for them, but um, it strikes me that there's a there's a huge danger of actually creating further divisions between the different different ethnic groups. Yes, we've been at this now since 2014, and we're the most active reparations group in the Caribbean. We've written books, we've TV programs, etc. And the general consensus is of other races is that yes, this happened. So what? Move on. Um, there seems, Guyana is a very racist society. We have to accept that. Structurally, if you look at the business community, um, if you look at the, the, the top thousand businesses, you may find one or two African businesses. And of course that platforms into oil and all sorts of things. So because of the nature of our society and the unwillingness and because of religious reasons, the caste system, and I'm just being honest, um, instead of it being a healing discussion, it will become more, um, divisive, and because there are many racial entrepreneurs in the society, they will use this because they're linking the needs of African Guyanese to the PNC and the PPP, and, and those are separate discussions, but they become so intertwined. 
that once you're black, you seem to be PNC regardless of what your needs are and what your rights are. So I don't see in the, in the short term any healing when it comes to that. It will take a courageous leader to say that this is what is right and that we need to heal Guyana. If not, we'll be exploited more with our oil contract, which is one of the most odious contracts you'll ever see. Um, okay, so I think certainly this is a discussion we need to have on another day. <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot that needs to be talked about. But I would love um, just thank you um, so much for talking about the Guyana Reparations Committee and just sharing um, with everybody here what what the um, uh, commission is, has been focused on of late. I want to bring in now, if I can, um, Kibwe Copeland. Um, but yeah, if everybody could just say thank you to Eric, really appreciate it. Um, and of course, you're mentioned in the book. So <laughs> you have to read the book, you're mentioned. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to take you off. I had you on. Um, okay. Let me see if I can find Kibwe. There we go. Kibwe. There you go. Okay, great. Uh, Kibwe, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. I wondered, okay, so you're, you're the uh, president of the, uh, is it pronounced Ikem, Ikemba? Ikemba yes, Youth Organization? Say yes, again? Ikemba. Ikemba. Okay, right. perfect. Um, I, I hadn't heard about it and I, I, I learned about it really through um, Thomas and I just wondered for, for people in the diaspora, can you talk to us a little bit about what the organization does and also what, what um, I know you're, you're also in, involved in pushing the um, discussion about reparations forward, um, so right. if you can tell us something about that as well. All right. Um, now, Ikimba is the first youth reparation organization in the Caribbean. It was actually formed in 2017 and 26th of November. It was inspired, of course, by, of course, the continuous call for young people to get involved in the whole discussion of reparations. And more than just the discussion, but of course, we understand that around the world, young people have always been the drivers of any movement. So getting young people in involved, of course, would, of course, accelerate the movement itself. So. A group of uh, young activists were pulled together. This was at CARICOM Secretariat um, under the leadership of Dr. Hilary Brown, who's a program manager for human and social development. And of course, Eric Plips, who's the chairman of the Ghana Reparations Committee. And we were pulled together to have a two day workshop on how we can, of course, deal with the messaging of reparations. Because we know reparations is something that's been long, it's a fight that's been constant for years. But only in 2017, we now have young people that have actually have an organization that deals with it. So it says a lot about the gap of information because even to the young persons who now lead this organization, at one point, we were not as knowledgeable as we should have been. Well, yes, if you could debate what, sh what should and what should be. So after that today workshop, these young people, which myself included, I uh, have some members who are also on this call, Nico Frank, who's the vice president, and Kemi Beaton, second vice president, also have Suli Kalimor. I'm not too sure exactly who else is on the, on the call right now. But we came together and said, you know what, instead of just giving our, in, our involvement and giving our ideas, which will be sent to some um, secretary or to some office to be analyzed, why not form this organization? Of course, under the leadership and the, the blessings of Dr. Brown and Eric Phillips, form this organization that will actually champion the cost reparations the youthful way. So we started in, you know, um, we had our elections, I was voted in president and so forth, and we moved from there. And of course, one of the things that we would understand, one of the things that we would have um, looked at very seriously is that reparations is something that is, is big. It is something that deals with a very, um, people call a controversial uh, issue, but it's something that is very fun fundamental for people of African descent. But most of the language and most of what you can read or find with online or even from speeches that has been recorded, et cetera, are of academic nature. And we understand that the vast majority of the people in the world are not so, I'm not saying that people are, in, are, are, are what should I say, are illiterate, but we must come to the realization that the way and how people take in information today is totally different from how we would have done in the past. So people are more, uh, compelled by short videos and by memes and by certain things that it can captivate it very shortly. 
and I also have this personal belief about setting seeds and giving somebody a whole long book. So we understand that a lot of what is being said about reparations, even the word itself, the meaning, or even just hearing the word reparations is completely foreign to a lot of young people and even to senior folks. And when people hear about the word reparations, the first thing comes to mind is money. It's about African people asking white people to pay them some money for some debt that is owed to them because of slavery, which is gone so many years ago. Why talk about it now? We have more problems with crime and blah, blah, blah. So we are now in a position to try to narrate the complex language, the in-depth um, columns of um, articles and long one hour to two hour video clips of speeches, et cetera, and to package it that young people and for people who are not even young, who may have a short attention span, can understand what this issue is all about and how they play a part of it. I believe one of the most important things to getting people involved into any movement or into, to get uh, be interested in anything is to understand how they play a part, how it affects them. You know, when we hear about, you know, COVID-19, COVID-19 is a big deal around the world. We all get scared. Some people are very reckless until one of their family members die from COVID-19. They put on a mask, they're far more careful, they spray in the house with Lysol all the time because then there's a personal connection to COVID-19 or your mother died, your sister with a pass away, your close friend. Then you start to feel like, you know what? If this person so close to me can, can be affected so much, then it's possible that I can be affected as well. So our aim is, of course, to, sh to make that link between what happened in that period of 400 years of enslavement, for example, in Indiana, 215 years, and link it to what is happening to us today. We talk about the legacy of slavery. Legacy of slavery speaks of the legacy that of that time that affects us today. Incarceration, um, diabetes, hypertension, African people being prone to it. We talk about um, the opportunities for higher learning, education. We talk about business. Uh, films talk about the structure in Guyana that, of course, favors some ethnic backgrounds more than some. So there's clear, not only in Guyana, but across the country and across the world, that there are several disparities between people who are white, people who are African, and all the other ethnic, um, ethnic backgrounds. So we're in a position now to try to simplify it. Because when people hear these long titles, they ask, what really does it mean? Not everybody has the time. And, we, and you know, it's not about, you know, they had this conversation about what should matter and what should not. And me coming to somebody and saying, you know what? Reparation is something that matters to you because you're an African person. You should be concerned about what happened to your, your four parents and what has happened to you now. That doesn't mean that they should. So instead of taking that, that approach of telling what they should be in charge or what they should want to know about, we try to find ways to get to set the seeds to spark their own curiosity because that's the best way to teach anybody anything. I'm not going to force, force reparations down to anybody. I'm going to give them some facts. I'm going to try to link it to what they're personally dealing with in life for them to understand how important reparations is. You know, Thomas' book would have done is an act of reparations. And you, you asked Mr. Phillips a question about, do you think that when we're going to have to receive reparations? I, it's my personal belief that reparations is an ongoing thing. Of course, the biggest thing, of course, is when Europe admits, which is the first point in the 10-point character reparation 10-point plan, a full and formal apology. They accept that they, they committed a crime and that it ought to be a crime, as they would have said. And after that acknowledgement, they would then find ways, of course, of giving reparations. I'm grateful for things like HR 40, which is putting together a commission to understand reparations and how we can actually come to a, either a total or ways of actually giving reparations. But I'm also thankful for like this by Thomas Harden, White Debt, which is helping to give people a view of what actually happened. And also coming from somebody who's white, you know, um, of course, this was always a big issue for Thomas, a white man telling a story of African people. And it's been a, it has been a problem for many African people around the world. Why does the white man tell our story? We should be telling our story. And we have to understand that, of course, as much as we tell our story, a lot of people are not listening to us. But even as much as they might not like this book, they're going to look, look at it because of, why would he write such a book? And for some, they would agree. Now, one of the points I want to touch when it comes to this book, and a white guy, of course, writing a book like this, when I was in South Africa in 2018, at the Reparations, Reconciliation, and Recognition Conference, there was a particular session whereby a woman would have showed a, a clip of African people being burnt in tires, We're talking about the apartheid, apartheid era. And after that clip showing the atrocity that African people would have faced, the clip changed to a white woman in a bathtub who was devastated and went into, uh, what should I say, 
into the pressure of what she would have witnessed. Hmm. Now the whole um, scenario, the whole focus was shift from the African people who were burnt, didn't make any mention of their families, and was shifted to that white woman and what she had to live with, witnessing such crimes. At that time, myself, my friend Anna Howie and Diara, we would have stand up and we left that room immediately because that is what has been happening across the world. Even when you type in reparations, what is, rep what is reparations? Sometimes in YouTube, the first might pop up. I remember when I did this once, it was a black guy being interviewed by a white guy. And when he was asking the black guy about reparations, he was saying that slavery was something that African people had to deal with because of whatever they would have done in the past. It's their way of repenting and something concerning in the Christian language. So when you see a white person can put together a book that tells the story, that helps to tell the story from a black perspective, and of course his own perspective, because that same thing that Elizabeth said, trust me, I loved your presentation, Alyssa. Um, when it comes to his story, history is our story. Most times when we think about slavery, the first thing comes to mind, oh, African people's history. But we all had a part to play in it, African people or white people. We were enslaved, Africa, and the white people were the enslavers. So history is our history. I don't know if I'm bubbling up too much because something could go on and on. I don't know if you have any important <laughs> questions you want to ask. So I'm just going to pause here. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to pick up on what you and Alyssa have spoken about in terms of Thomas being the author of the book. Um, right. Because what I thought was, what, what it struck me was that Thomas does have access to publishers that we don't necessarily have. Uh -huh. um, but I felt he had used that privilege in order to provide voices, our voices, because actually the whole way through the book, we're being constantly reminded that Thomas has gone to Guyana, he's met this person, this person's telling him X, Y, and Z. So I actually felt in a way um, that this was, I mean, it, to me, it's just an amazing example to other people about what's possible. You know, if you are a white person and one of the things you are worried about and concerned about you know is the serious question as to why are you writing about black history was just the wonderfully transparent way that actually thomas demonstrated that okay yeah. he, he may be the author on the spine but actually he did it with all of these other black people all of these people from guyana who helped and therefore used his privilege to help give us all a voice and i i actually found that really um i thought that was really powerful and the best that anybody could have done in his position so i um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what, on what you were saying about it, because I, I understand where you're coming from, but um, I also just thought it, thought it was a genius way of doing it, basically. <laughs> Correct. And, and, and that's on that same point. I totally agree with you. Yeah. You know, um, he, of course, is the author, and we understand the leverage he has as being an author who's been recognized. Mm -hmm. And of course, he has the access to the publishers, which we might not have access to. And why is it this is an act of reparation? For example, my organization is one of the first youth reparations in the, in the Caribbean. You yourself said it yourself. You did not know about this organization, mm. right? Even though this organization has been doing, doing a lot of things from 2017 to now, and I could go to a whole long list. But because of this book, you're now people to it. So that is putting this movement on a, on a different level of, what you call it, a different level of spotlight. And where I was added to the book in his postscript, there's a part in the book, which I'll just quickly read, when he said, there go. therefore, I agree with Quebec. Reparations should be made to the descendants of those enslaved by the British. If we don't confront our history now, we will just pass the burden on the future, onto the future generations. This is not about feeling guilty for what our ancestors did before we were born. It's about addressing the legacy of slavery that still impacts people today. Harm has been done, repair must be made. Now, that is Thomas actually pushing mm. the movement of reparations. And he would have added my organization, he came, he would have added our work and what we've been doing. And that is, that is publicity that I can't pay, Mr. That I can't pay Thomas for, right? <laughs> so um, this book, of course, is something historic. And we must commend Thomas. I've, I've always been commending him since the day we met and we had, you know, what I admire about him is that he didn't, as he explained, he's not somebody who just tried to do research. He wanted to come on the ground itself. He wanted to be among the people. He wanted to hear from persons who have been working on reparations for years. Some people might have hear, um, heard about these names for the first time, but these people have been doing the work years and years over, not been getting that kind of recognition. 
yes, they've been recognized, but Thomas have opened another channel for recognition for them. I remember when we went on parade ground. Hey, hey, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm just recognizing that it's nearly five o'clock. And so yes. I've done the usual Guyanese thing of completely not paying any attention to the time. <laughs> And I just wanted to make sure um, that the audience were able to partake in at least maybe let, let's have like 15 minutes of questions or something. Um, no problem. But, but I just wanted to say if you have a link to your organization or if there's any way that people um, can get involved and learn more about it, if you could put the details in the chat, I'd really appreciate it. But, um, thank you so much. Thank you. And again, um, let's just say thank you to Kibwe Copeland for, for your presentation there. Um, now, so I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions and if you can, um, use the, oh, by the way, um, yeah, I don't know if you can hear Rod in the background going shout out to Major General Joe Singh. Um, we're really, really delighted to have you, um, there, uh, online, um, uh, Major General, if you, if you wanted to, can we invite you to say something? Cause I know you spoke um with Thomas and also took him into the uh, back dams and so forth could you come online and speak a bit if you're there still there <laughs> let me just see if I can find um Joe Singh hold on oh no I think he may have gone oh no did I miss Joe what a shame um Thomas, is there anybody else that's online that you know that was involved in the book? I wasn't sure whether Jocelyn Dow had been. I think Jocelyn's online. Has she? Yeah, jo Jocelyn, Jocelyn uh, was wonderful. I and mean, there's been a bunch of people. Uh, Rodney Van Cooten is here from Australia. It's probably 4 a.m. I think Rodney's been up from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. as part of this call, which is, shows enormous stamina. Oh, right. Well, I'll ask so Rod, um, Rod Rodney first, was, um, and, then, and then I'll go to... Um, jo uh, Jocelyn. Um, Ro is it Rodney Van Kooten? Um, I'm gonna hang on a minute, Rodney. Uh, let me go here, replace the spotlight. There we go. There we go. If you could unmute yourself, and thank you for joining us from Australia at a, a godly, ungodly hour. <laughs> You're welcome. I, um, I just wanted to know what, what, what your involvement was, really. Um, part of the uprising. The story is part of my great great grandfather's story. So, Hendrik Hendrik Van Kooten, who was um, the involved in uh, the Bride's Last Plantation, uh, was is is in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as part of my family research, I was able to contribute some of the sources that I'd found to to Thomas's um, story. And Thomas also interviewed my father, so he's in the book as well sort of giving a, a brief perspective on on what it means to be an inheritor of the the oppressive side of things as well um the other part of the story is hendrick's wife uh, was of african descent and so i've got african in me and i'm i'd love to find out more about his wife dorothea so that's that's sort of my interest in, in engaging in the story. Interesting, interesting to have um, both sides. But also, I just I actually think that um, one of the things I would like to see as part of reparations is families with personal letters and correspondence from that period actually freeing up. Um, those documents and putting them in the public domain. So I think it's wonderful that you um, shared it with Thomas so that at least, you know, we, we have greater insights into, um, you know, the uprising. But um, yeah, just for anyone who's listening, I think that's, there's a lot of families here in the UK, certainly who feel very uncomfortable um, about re revealing their own family's connections. And they have a huge archive of um, letters of correspondence that would really shed greater light on, on the history of slavery. But um, yeah, there's, there's certainly a great amount of resistance to do that. Um, well, I've, I've got a website that sort of Thomas found. Um, and in fact, my parents transcribed the John Smith diary. And so that's up online on my website for, for everyone to read. So I see that as part of paying forward, um, sort of making the story known. Could you share that link with us? Sure. If you could put it in the chat, that would be fantastic. 
Um, but thank you. I, I'm going to invite um, Jocelyn down now, if I can. Um, if I can see where Jocelyn is. Um, Jocelyn, are you there? I'm just going to take this, remove that. Oops. Hi, Juanita. Yes, I haven't seen you forever. Hang on a minute. I want to. I want to be able to see your face. You're hiding. Spotlight. Where are you? I I'm in my pajamas. You're in your pajamas. <laughs> okay. So Hi. <laughs> you can see my face. I can see you Hi. now. Fantastic. How are you? Oh well, here you know, I miss COVID and everything oh. else. Delighted to be um, listen to this program. It was great. And Thomas is being overly generous. He came well, here uh, as um, Alisa, I think, asked me to help. And you know, I'm a networker, so put them in touch with John Bigot and whoever and whoever. Vicky Jackson was here. They went up the Boris Siri and so on. But uh, listening to the program, I was really, I'm interested if I may, in a, a few things I thought were significant to me. One of which is um, that. The question of whether white people should write about enslavement, of course, they were the perpetrators of a crime mm -hmm. and they have a view and they have a responsibility to speak about it um, in terms of not the usual glorification, but in fact, to tell, uh, uh, help to tell the truth of what occurred. So I think in that sense, the book has been, um, for me personally, uh, something really I was very glad to have assisted in a small way in, in terms of um, helping Thomas to navigate what was going on here. And of course, when he came to Guyana, at that time, they were chasing people off, um, squatters off the plantation that used to be plantation success. So it was a kind of odd moment, the, the synchronicity of it, as he said, to have arrived at that point when they were having this battle over what were, to all intents and purposes, retired sugar fields. Right. That they then said um, were to be used in the whole question of um, new varieties. It's curious to me because my brother was sharing guys to go under the previous government and I have many friends with a long history in sugar. So mm. it was like a moment as if you had in fact had a, a time capsule that uh, people were being chased off the land by quote unquote, the new owners of the new plantations mm -hmm. were chasing poor blacks and poor Indians as in this case off of the lands. So it was a, a very, um, it, it was serendipitous in a certain way that he came then and in a sense brought to life something that was so part. I, we'd been part of film that had to do with the seawall. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, there was this one called um, Tales of the Seawall, which were about the planters and, and the issue of uh, flooding and so on. And, you know, we were, we've had major floods in this period. And it's so much about our current life that has had to do with the making of this coast. Mm. And I think for many people that people don't realize that the, the coast of Guyana is man-made. And if it's not maintained, and you know, Walter had said in his book, I think 20 million tons of mud were removed mm -hmm. by shovel by slaves mm -hmm. to create what is the coast of Guyana. So when you hear these ridiculous presentations that black people have, Africans have had nothing to do with the building of Guyana, mm -hmm. they have created the very coast of Guyana. A hundred, so, a hundred million tons, a hundred million, a hundred million tons, million tons yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That you can't begin to imagine it, even with bulldozers mm. and, and backhoes, what it must have been like over those many, many um, decades and centuries. Yeah. So I, I think that for me, that that's, it's good that it's coming out now. Mm. I think it was, um, I'm glad that Thomas chose to, to fill it with the, 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 all the things that he talked about to make it real, make the people real. Um, to make their um, the pain and suffering very real. And the whole question of reparations, I mean, I never understand what the difficulty is 
we are living in a present enslavement with some new instruments called, you know, structural adjustment, um, World Bank, IMF, international finance, all of those things are just new instruments of an old game. And I think the more that we realize that very little has changed structurally in terms of the economy. You know, you have some opportunities and you have this, but that the basic inequalities are very much uh, alive and well. And what is the tragedy is when in your own country, that has come out of that, those equalities are real and perceived in the present day. You no, know, I, I think um, what um, Kibwe was saying about COVID being a classic example of it, uh, of, of the continuation of that kind of oppression. Here in the UK, I mean, we haven't really shared any of the vaccine, but also refusing to share the intellectual property with African countries who have the capability to, you know, they've got the capability to produce it, um, but they're preventing them from having that intellectual, um, you know, because it's got intellectual property, preventing them from using the, producing the vaccines. Um, so yeah, it's just a continuation of a long history. But also I think, as you're saying, that whole um, people being turfed off the land, it's just a, a new, new, you know, that whole neo-colonial kind of context. But, um, but I know you would have helped, um, you would have been a huge help because everyone in the room needs to be aware that you were an enormous help to me <laughs> when I was in Guyana. And um, I've, I've never had the opportunity to thank you publicly. So I'm gonna say thank you so much for making my time in Guyana hugely pleasurable. <laughs> so, uh, I miss the swims. <laughs> I, I miss the swimming, honestly, so much. <laughs> in, the, in that Olympic sized swimming pool, it was huge. <laughs> yeah, I had great fun. But, uh, you know, I think that what the book gives us an opportunity to, uh, to do now in Guyana with Exxon and all that is on here is to really, I hope, invite many of the listeners and others to, to put a closer lens on Guyana and what is happening here currently, you know? Um, so that I think that the, the fact that the book is coming out this year, I call this year the terrible tooth, tooth, tooth you know, because it seems to me to started with horrible stuff um, already worldwide. And that um, we have to be really work with solidarity and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, this is why I'm, you know, I've not been a good listener to your program, but I was really delighted mm -hmm. to be here today. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And I will make sure that I am now keep on track. Thank um, you. <laughs> so Rod, Rod, hail up to you. I think Rod, Rod like stand up in the background. No one can see you. <laughs> he's he's always here in the background. <laughs> show hello, your face, Mr. man. Show hello, your face. Hello, Miss West. Hello, hello. I, Mr. So, West. Uh, <laughs> so it's great to, um, to see that after your trip tour in Guyana, that you've taken it to another level. And I think, we, you know, that, that, that is what. And I think, um, Thomas, I hope this is not going to be your only book on Guyana and that we are going to, in fact, be able to learn more from other historians and other writers yeah. um, more about it. So, hail up, uh, best of wishes, stay safe. Um, and, you know, COVID is just to me the last, or one expression of what the world is going to be like in, in the very near future. I don't think this is going away. And if it goes away, we're going to have COVID-20 or something else. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, in, we're in that cycle, I think. Yeah. yeah. And we have to be for each other and, and, you know, care about each other. So to the groups like Eric and um, the young man who I'd not heard about, so please put your website up. I've been fighting more current battles, but reparations, of course, we all should be involved in. Absolutely. Right? So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Thomas and Elisa, of course, <laughs> for putting me in touch. Lots of love to everyone. Lots of love, lots of love. I'm gonna bring Thomas back for a second. Um, just want to spotlight him for everyone. Thomas, you're back. Um, before I say anything to you first, I just wanna read, um, David Alston has said, 
Thomas is a powerful storyteller and his book will reach people who will not be reached by academic histories. Um, reparations are due, a suggestion at the end of slavery in 1838, um, there were more Scottish born whites in Guyana than English born whites. So approaches should not uh, should be made to the Scottish government, not just the UK government, and perhaps to the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, and as Alyssa says, the, it's a very um, excellent point by David Alston, um, and she agrees fully. Uh, we've also got the link there to your column um, that's going to be featuring in the diaspora column. Um, was there any other comments from people? Uh, just what I just, can I just say, um, I mean, yeah. I've found the, 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 for me, it's this evening, it's, it's become dark here, but it's been so extraordinarily uh, moving and inspirational uh, hearing everyone share um, their, their ideas. And I just want to uh, thank you. Uh, there's some other people on the call who I haven't thanked yet. So Keith Williams is here and D. George from Hermanson Lodge. And they, they, um, they took me out to some uh, sugar uh, estates and I learned you know, a bit about how sugar is made today. And so Kathleen is also here from the university. So thank you. So, I mean, so many people helped me in Guyana and as well as in Britain uh, and North America. So it's, I, and thank you Juanita and Rod for putting on today's event because it's been incredibly significant for me anyway, personally. And I really appreciate, really appreciate it. No, it's been fantastic. Um, Quarter past, quarter past five. I, I think I better let people go <laughs> at this point. But you, you know, obviously there's there's a lot of interest. Um, there has been yeah. a lot of interest in there, and there's loads of comments in the chat which I'm going to be saving as well as the um, mm -hmm. recording. Um, and also, I don't know if was Elsie Harris on on the call. Did she? Did she joined. I don't think Elsie Harry. No, she she wasn't able to make it today. I think she wasn't able to make it. Okay, that's that's fine. But yeah, I I don't know um, if you wanted we wanted to close. By by reading a tiny little bit of the book, sure. or whether we should just sure. yeah, let's do that and then and then we'll we do a little, Do you want me to read something? Okay, hold on. I don't know which passage. But... Are, are you are you going to read something, or do you want me to read something? No, no, no. If you okay. can read, it'd be it'd be great. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me. I wonder if Kibway would forgive me. Kibway, would you forgive me if I read the section where we are together? No problem. No problem. Okay, that's at the, it's at the end of the book. I, I'll just do a part of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the postscript. So uh, on my last day in Guyana, I met with Kibwe Copeland, the first, the 28 year old president of Ikemba, the first youth reparations organization in the Caribbean. It's early, just after sunrise. And we are standing in the middle of the parade ground in Georgetown an area of scrubby grassland the size of four football fields. This is the place where more than 50 abolitionists were executed in the autumn of 1823. At the far edge, a group of, group of men play basketball. Other than that, the place is empty. We are here to remember those who took part in the uprising. We take off our shoes and stand barefoot on the damp earth. We talk for a few minutes about the uprising, the trials, and how those found guilty were marched through the streets to this ground. Kibwe then reads out the names of those who were executed here. Alec, Attila, Bethley, Billy, Damas, Daniel, Evan, France, Hamilton, Harry of Good Hope. After each name, he pours a few drops from a bottle of water onto the ground paying respect to the ancestors and then says, Ashe, and so it is. He kept going. Harry of Triumph, Lewis, Murphy, Natty, Nelson, Philip, Pickle, Quamina of Newtonzol, Quintus, Scipio, Tom. After he is finished, we stand silent for a few minutes. Then Kibwe says, if it wasn't for them, I would not have the freedom of speech that I have. I would not be able to walk as a free man. Because of their sacrifices, I can. That's wonderful. And the perfect way um, to end remembering our ancestors and um, 
you know, the huge sacrifices they made for us all. And um, yeah, I just want to say thank you. Honestly, Thomas, it's been amazing being involved, been amazing reading the book. I loved the book. I know everybody else will. And I really love that you showed it, it was that just so many people are involved in the process and that um, that was really gratifying and uh, actually gave me added faith in the book in that I, I knew you'd done your research properly as well, yeah. which was, was well, really I mean, I have to say you, you and Rod were amazing and generous in, in sharing your network and I couldn't have done it without you guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, yeah, I mean, let's just all put our hands together if you want to um, uh, share your videos and yeah, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to turn the record off now. And